Well, welcome to the Henry Center for Theological Understanding Scripture and Ministry Interview. Today we're with uh, Dallas Willard, the philosophy professor at the uh, University of Southern California, as well as Steve Farish, who is uh, pastor of Crossroads, Crossroads Church in nearby Graves Lake. So thank you for joining us today. And Steve, I'd like to ask you if you could uh, ask, talk, ask Dr. Willard our first question today. Thank you. And Dr. Willard, thank you for your lecture yesterday, which is, of course, also great privilege. posted on the uh, Henry Center website. In the course of the lecture, we all knew in advance that you're a professor of philosophy at Southern California and had been for many, many years. But you revealed in the course of it also that you're a, an ordained Southern Baptist pastor. And I wondered if you would be kind enough to give us something of your uh, story, how the Lord brought those two pieces of your life together, that background and then that uh, mm -hmm that career in philosophy as well. Well, certainly by no wisdom of my own, <laughs> mm -hmm. I assure you. Um, I went uh, through uh, Baptist schools, uh, three, in my undergraduate education. And when I finished at Baylor, my wife and I went back to Macon, Georgia, where she was from. And uh, we taught school, and I was assistant pastor at a... At a uh, Baptist Church there. And during that year, I decided I was almost terminally ignorant about God and the soul. And I found an awful lot of it in the Bible, but not any helpful teaching about it, beyond what you could just glean from the wording of the Scripture. And um, by that time, I knew that philosophers spent more time talking about those two things than anybody. Hmm. And so I decided to go back to graduate studies in philosophy. With, I'd had no intention of taking a degree. I just thought I would uh, spend a couple of years uh, studying uh, and then go back either into the pastorate or teaching or evangelism or something of that sort. But one thing led to another, and they were very supportive and gracious uh, there at Wisconsin. And uh, so uh, within a few years, I wound up with a PhD. And they asked me to stay the following year to teach some courses they needed taught. And I was glad to do that. And during that year, I uh, served as pastor to a couple of little churches out in the countryside that couldn't get pastors. And uh, it was a wonderful year, and we had a really blessed time, uh, mainly at a little town called Arena, Wisconsin. I'm sort of putting my history here on the map. I don't, uh, during that year, the Lord said to me, now, if you stay in the universities, the churches will be open to you. If you stay in the church, the universities will be closed to you. Mm -hmm. And I know it was the Lord, not just from the quality of the experience, but I was not smart enough to figure that out. And in the, late, in the middle 60s, it was still true that the church was the cultural authority, even in a very liberal place like Madison, Wisconsin. Madison, mm-hmm. But no one took the church on, even there. Uh, and I had no idea what we were on the cusp of as far as our society mm -hmm, goes. Mm -hmm. so this wasn't very welcome to me. I, hadn't, I had no plan of, of being a university professor. But it seemed very clear that I should at least see how it went. And I more or less... Um, just said to the Lord, well, we'll take it a year of time and see how it goes. <laughs> and so, so 45 years later. 45 years later, <laughs> here I am. I think actually, I don't mean to be self-laudatory, but things went very well. And my work in philosophy was well regarded. And the opportunities to minister, I found, were often more frequent than a pastor. Mm -hmm. 
who has to deal with the church and all of the committees and activities, uh, but I wound up being able to speak more often than many pastors do because I didn't have to stay around and straighten it all out. <laughs> <laughs> so it has worked out, in my perception, wonderfully well. And uh, the university has been very encouraging and supportive of me. My colleagues uh, are just wonderful, and um, and I was able to do all the things you're supposed to do, shall we say. And uh, so uh, perhaps the only additional thing I found was that the kind of work that one does in philosophy, if they are following the traditional pattern is very close to ministry work. The questions that classical philosophy and philosophy really up until the 20th century tried to answer are basically the ones that uh, Jesus Christ provides the answers to. And so I don't, uh, I don't uh, be defensive or anything. I just, you know, I'm open to any question, any comment, and I try to communicate that spirit to the students. And um, so it has just been a wonderful thing. Now, I write more in philosophy than I do in religion, but nobody reads that. <laughs> an, an internationally known philosopher is one who has a friend in Mexico and one in Belgium. <laughs> and, uh, so. In any case, um, I find the work very useful to me. My work in philosophy is very important for everything else I do, both at USC with the, uh, as a presence on the campus mm -hmm. and um, in my writing. Well, if I may, uh, that was actually going to be my second question, if I <laughs> could insert it here. By all means. You, your studies are more than anything else in epistemology. So how right. has that informed your writing on the spiritual disciplines, the life of God mm -hmm. and the soul of man, mm -hmm. if, I could, if I could use that yes, term that you focused term, on? Yes, a great, great old traditional term. I wish uh, we knew more about that topic. Mm -hmm. But it's really, uh, for example, the first book I published, and all of the books in religion that I published basically come out of series of talks that I give. I've never really sought to publish a book in religion, um, but I talk an awful lot. And um, actually, uh, uh, Kenneth Krantzer, who has some association with this, is the one who sort of got me first to do something in writing in Christianity because hmm. um, he had heard about topics, uh, a series on discipleship, and through uh, the Christianity Today, uh, I was asked to write a little article on discipleship, which is in the appendix to the spirit of the discipline. Mm -hmm. That's the first. I had never intended to write. I mean, you, you are in philosophy, and you can see how sort of far off I was, but it was through that and then others. The, the first book that I published is now called Hearing God, was called In Search of Guidance at the time, was requested of me by an editor because of a series. But now when you think about it, the heart of that book is about knowing what it's like for God to speak to you, because that's a highly contested issue. And people do go around talking about God told me this, God told me that, God told me the other. And sometimes you wonder if you're uh, off in space somewhere with that because it really doesn't make much sense to many people. But yet there's a reality to it. And we desperately need to know when it's real and when it's not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that is a problem yes. in the theory of knowledge. And uh, the... Spirit of the Disciplines, which is, uh, I guess, the next in line of the religious books, that is an attempt to answer the question of classical 
philosophy, Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, and so on. And really, again, until the 20th century, it's an attempt to answer the question, how do you become a good person? And, of course, Christ's answer to that is, become my disciple. And then the practices of the spiritual disciplines are means that the disciple uses to become the kind of person that really everyone knows we ought to be. You know, I mean, that was the unsolved problem of Greek civilization. Uh, Plato and Socrates and Aristotle and all of them, they knew what kind of person you should be, but they couldn't figure out how you got people like that. And that eventually defeated all of the wonderful ideas of Greek civilization until I think it was 310 B.C., the Greeks, who were so busy killing one another, these wonderful refined people, that they had to call the Romans in to keep them from killing one another. Mm -hmm. and of course, the Romans never left. <laughs> that was their way with it. Uh, but they did, put a, they did put an end to Sparta and Athens, killing one another and the other city-states attacking one another. But that was the unsolved problem. That's where Christianity comes on the scene. And by the second century A.D., the leading thinkers of the Greco-Roman world recognized that Jesus Christ and his people answered the questions they had been trying to answer for 800 years. And that's why in the second century there was a really a mass conversion of intellectuals in the Greco-Roman world to Christ. And then it built from there. So there really is, you know, I often just summarize the main questions of human life is what is real, who's well off, who's a really good person, how do you get to be a really good person? Now those are as contemporary as today's mm -hmm, newspapers. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you don't want to hear a lecture on those now, but those are the questions that the Bible and Jesus Christ and his people through the ages have answered. And the answers that they have provided are very clearly superior to the answers of any other group of people, East or West. Now, when I say that, I always say that by saying, look, show me something different. Hmm. And I present Jesus Christ as someone who would say, if you can find a better way than what I've got, you should take it. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of person he is. He's a person wow. of truth. Now, are you able to do that in the classroom? Oh, absolutely. The only issue is relevance. See, I teach philosophy. Relevance is the key. Is, I don't go in to preach or convert people. Mm -hmm. I teach philosophy. But see, Jesus Christ is the most intelligent man who ever lived on earth. Something greater than Solomon is here. Uh, something <laughs> greater than Solomon is here. And greater than Freud mm -hmm. and Kant mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so on down the line. So it's just uh, what I have, what I do. Very, I, I'm very painstaking to make it clear. Look, I'm ready to hear any argument, and I will listen. And I'm open to change. If you got it, I want it. You know. I have a question for you, uh, Doctor. Uh, unfortunately, Willard. that's not that's no longer the general attitude at the, on the universities. It's closed-mindedness. It's closed-minded. Yeah. Well, related to this discussion is what is truth and can we know it? And I think that the church in, in many areas, are, the church is debating to what extent we can know truth. Well, this is um, uh, one of the amusing things about our ordinary universities from the east to the west. The most common statement that is written in stone and not with spray cans on university walls is you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Now, that's on the wall of my philosophy building at USC, but they've let a tree grow up where you can't see it. I'm sure it. Share it. <laughs> oh, gosh. Truth is embarrassing to people now on the campus, and truth is a very simple thing. You know, your beliefs are true if what they are about is as you believe it to be. That's true. It's very simple. 